Hello and welcome to our annual quality improvement and family planning training. Um, we offer this training on an annual basis due to new staff being present or even staff that's been there for a while need a refresher course as uh, a lot of our reporting is due at the beginning of every year. So we'll discuss more about understanding the family planning quality improvement process in this presentation. So just a overview of the agenda. Um, we'll provide your overview of what we'll be discussing today, define acronyms that are commonly used when we're looking at title team reporting, timelines of deadlines that should be adhered to as much as possible, um, Title TN support from MCH, which you can expect from us. Family planning quality improvement measures, which is on your um, participation plan that was covered by Ira Farley in another video. Um, and then we'll talk about the customer satisfaction survey. So when we're talking about acronyms, um, you might see a few acronyms that are highlighted on SharePoint. Um, also within your emails or different areas. And so we just wanted to make sure that you had a baseline understanding of what all the acronyms mean. So RCPP um, is also known as our Regional Community Participation Plan. This is a plan that is um, developed for the different regions to come together and look at what community outreach they'll do in regards to family planning. More information um, will be discussed or has been discussed in another recording from Ira Farley. The FPQI, also known as Family Planning Quality Improvement, this looks at more specifically quality improvement for our Title X um, clinics. This is what I'll be going over today. And then we have our Community Activity Reporting Survey, also known as CARS. Um, all of the activities that you're capturing your RCPP will be um, reported using our CARS forms um, and surveys. This information was also um, covered in a subsequent video by Ira Farley in detail. On our reporting, we talk mid-year. Mid-year looks at capturing data from January 1st to June 30th. This data is then reported by the deadline of July 31st. Um, we talk year end data. We're looking at data that captured from um, the subsequent six months, meaning July 1st to December 31st. Um, and so that data is then reported by January 31st of the following year. And then you might see CSS, which is also known as our client satisfaction surveys. So MCH, what can we do to assist? Um, as far as MCH, we send out monitoring updates to all DNMs in regards to their reporting. So um, as you identify what are some of your quality improvement measures that you're wanting to monitor, We'll make sure that you have access to those reports. We also assist in development and review of your RCPP plans, um, looking at targets and interventions. We're trying something different this year to where we're going to start working with you all earlier in the year. So therefore, as 2023 approaches, most of your plans are in place at the beginning of the year. Um, and we assist in development and review of quality improvement targets. This is where my area comes in, just to make sure that your targets are um, timely and realistic for what you're trying to accomplish. We also provide any feedback and strategies for success. We wanna make sure that each Title Ten clinic or family planning clinic is successful in the services that they deliver. Um, and then uh, we email any follow-up if baseline media uh, or end of year reports have not been received. So we try to make sure we build a reminder as to um, ensure that all reporting um, and activities and outreach that you're doing within your clinics are counted when we do our grant reporting. 
So quality improvement, we're talking about that. Um, so provided by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, quality improvement is defined as a framework used to systematically improve care. Quality improvement is also seen to standardize processes and structures to reduce variation, achieve predictable results, and improve outcomes for patients, healthcare systems, and organizations. The Family Planning Program endorses a quality improvement system design to ensure that the highest quality is provided of client services. Service sites provide family planning services should have a process for conducting quality improvement, which is designed to review and strengthen the quality of services on an ongoing basis. More specifically, the purpose in this section is to um, describe the steps um, that will be implemented to be deliberate and continuous efforts throughout the yearly cycle to achieve measurable improvements in the identified indicators of quality care, which promote the health of the community, which is also highlighted in providing quality family planning services, conducting quality improvement. A lot of this information you will be able to find in your family planning manual. So why quality improvement? Um, according to the quality family planning recommendations developed collaboratively with CDC and the U.S. Office of Population Affairs outline how to provide services related to contraception pregnancy testing and counseling, achieving pregnancy and fertility, preconception health and sexual transmitted disease. So quality family planning recommendations. They're defined as services to offer a family planning visit, describe how to provide those services for women and men. They are highly designed for use with patients who need services related to preventing or achieving pregnancy. They are based on a rigor rigorous, systematic, transparent review of evidence, and with that input from a broad range of clinical experts from the Office of Population Affairs and CDC. They encourage the use of family planning visits to provide other essential preventive health services such as breast and cervical screenings. Um, they also include a special section on serving and unique needs to adolescents. So when patients express frustration about how long they had to wait to be seen at their appointments, um, in the example, there is a team of Haven Health Clinics in Amarillo, Texas, that uses quality improvement approach to improve clinic facility efficiency. Excuse me. So I'm going to unshare my screen for just one moment to make sure the sound is uh, provided, so we're able to see their approach to improving clinical efficiency. We're Haven Health Clinics, located in Amarillo, Texas, and we've been in business for 47 years. Our mission really is to prevent unintended pregnancy and to prevent sexually transmitted infections for the men and women in our community. Before we started Quality Improvement, I really didn't understand what it was going to be about, how it would help. We decided to focus on efficiency because we were having some issues with unhappy patients and they were waiting significantly long periods of time and we knew that we needed to do something different but we didn't quite know how to make those changes and so by using quality improvement we were able to figure out how to make those changes so that not only were we helping the patient, but we were also helping the staff. I feel like if patients know that they can come here and get in and out in a certain amount of time, then they would be more likely to come back. They'd be more likely to recommend us to their friends and family. Um, you know, sometimes the best advertisement is word of mouth. We got together as a group 
and all staff were involved. It, it wasn't just the clinicians and it wasn't just administration, but we got together as an entire clinic and said, these are the things that we know we need to work on based on wait time, paperwork time, the number of patients that the clinicians were able to see per hour. And we worked together as a team to say, here's what we need to do. We know these are issues, so let's all work together. Let's all contribute. And everybody had a voice in what we decided to work on. We used the model for improvement and um, along with that PDSA. And one of the things we decided to do was to work on reducing paperwork time for the patient. And originally in the plan, we said, well, we're gonna put all the paperwork on a clipboard and hand that to the patient and they're gonna fill all that out. And so that was the plan piece. And then we actually implemented, which was due. And then once we looked at the data, um, it told us that we really hadn't reduced our paperwork time significantly in the amount of time that we, what we wanted to. Um, and that was, once we looked at that data, then we went to the ACT piece and then um, went back and revised the plan to say, okay, we're gonna change this and we're gonna have all of the paperwork, all the information that we need on one piece of paper rather than on five pieces of paper. And we went through PDSA again. Implementing PDSA was very easy. It's mostly common sense and it's very effective when you plan, do, study, act. If something doesn't go right, you just start all over again and continue until something does work right. We got started with quality improvement. Uh, we made a plan um, with measurable goals and um, definitely pushed to, to reach those goals. And so really just looking at the numbers helped us tremendously decide whether something was working or it wasn't working. With a little help from the rest of the staff and the whole clinic coming together, we were able to kind of um, pinpoint the areas that needed all the help and needed the faster uh, processing to where we can get our patients in and out faster. As a provider, some advice that I might give um, as far as quality improvement is concerned would be to be patient. <laughs> um, usually we can tell if something's not working pretty quickly in the day or two, um, but you have to be patient. You have to be willing to give it a try before you, you know, scratch it off the list we were able to make some significant changes. I really, truly believe that it has affected the way we do business at the clinic. And it, again, focusing on the patient, that we really have improved things for them. And we have improved things for the staff, which just as a dual accomplishment um, is, gives me great satisfaction. All right. So, um, in that five minute video, it outlines how the Haven Health team decided what they wanted to do and what they wanted to work on, then use the PDSA cycle of quality improvement to decrease paperwork time, improve patient experience. Staff follow the steps plan. Uh, we're trying to figure out a new approach to reduce the paperwork and do, which provided patients with less paperwork to fill out. After several months of regular reviews of the data, which is a study, the team agreed on another change it could make to reduce patient paperwork from five pages to one, which is the act. Um, if you remember of what was being said as a provider, she did state that um, this is something that you should be able to give a try and be patient. Um, and sometimes the best advice is the word of mouth of a patient's experience. So as you go through the PDSA cycle, just keep the patient experience at a forefront. Okay. So I added the slide here as well. Um, this concentric circle diagram of providing quality family planning services 
This looks at more of the recommendations of CDC and the, and the US Office of Population Affairs. So this lays out a framework for family planning services with the context of related preventive health services and other preventive health services, how they overlap. So with the inner circle, uh, which being the orange circle, the family planning services, uh, which we focus on where we're at, we provide contraceptive services for clients who want to, to prevent pregnancy and space births. They also provide pregnancy testing and counseling, assist to achieve in pregnancy, basic infertility services, preconception health, which can include screenings for obesity, smoking, and mental health, and then sexual transmitted disease services, which can include HIV and AIDS. So that is what the core of what we're doing, family planning, our focus. But when we look at the middle circle, which is a blue, it's relative preventive health services that are appropriate to deliver in the context of family planning site visits, family planning visits, even if they do not contribute directly to achieving the preventing pregnancy, including screenings for breast cancer and cervical cancers. So those are other related um, present preventive health services that um, can be offered. And as we look out the outer circle, the other preventive health services include preventive health screenings for women as well as men, such as screenings for lipid disorders, skin cancer, colorectal cancer, and osteoporosis. Although important to the context of primary care, these services have no direct link to family planning services. So this is a time that you will go ahead and do the referral or um, them to seek services with a, a primary care provider. If you want to learn more about this um, framework for family planning and how that directly involves with the quality family planning services process, um, you can click on the learn more and it'll take you directly to the website for that and more information. So now let's get into the QI process. So when we're looking at the QI process or quality improvement process, um, these are following examples of measures that can be used to monitor the quality of family planning services. You can take the approach from health outcomes or you can look at structural measures. So performance measures providing information about how well the service site is being, is, is, being or is meeting um, pre-established goals for our, the community and the clients that we serve. The following are examples of measures that can be used for monitoring the quality of family planning services. So for example, in health outcomes, we can look at unintended pregnancies, teen pregnancies, um, adolescents using LARCs or long active contraceptions. Um, when we're looking at structural measures, uh, and this is where I see a lot of QI efforts within the Title 10 clinics. We're looking at effective structure, which is the proportion of female users age less than 24 who are screened annually for chlamydia infections, um, where they are screened annually for gonorrhea, a proportion to users who were tested for HIV during the past 12 months. So effective structures and looks at screenings, the number of screenings per year, as an example. Um, second example of timely structure and processes, this looks at the average number of days to the next appointment, accuracy of the information is entered into focus, or the patient flow analysis results, looking at process of how long does it take from the patient um, to be able to get back to the provider from the point of check-in um, through the time that the provider sees the patient or from check-in to check-out, looking at efficiencies. Um, the third is accessible structures and processes. This looks at expanding hours of operation, the proportion of total family planning encounters that are encounters with ongoing or continuous users, client satisfaction, that satisfaction is for survey results or more formal referral process. So accessibility um, or accessible structure process is looking at how do we include access to care services or those ongoing services for those that might need them. 
through their formal referral process. And lastly, we uh, can look at um, equitable structure, which looks at language assistance at all points of contact for the most frequent encountered language. So um, if you do know that you're in a population that might have um, Spanish speaking consumers or Burmese, being able to have um, materials um, in place that assist in providing equity as they access your clinic. So that might be something that you look at as far as the QI process. So what is required through Title 10, um, and this is also highlighted in your Title 10 program manual, is that all sites must select, measure, and assess at least one intermediate or outcome measure on an ongoing basis, which means one of these um, with the QI process is that you have to, to select. So just one. Um, so it might be that you look at um, the timely structure meeting, um, the prior example that I provided as far as client time to increase um, um, a, a smooth transition of care from the check-in process to the checkout process, what happens all in between there and get the efficiency of that. Where Mike looks at, and I know a lot of people use this as well, um, increase in access, um, so reducing the no-show the, the no -show rate, and so putting things in place to be able to decrease the number of no-show visits, um, you know, um, and be able to offer slots for those that might no-show to those that might need those appointment slots. So it might be something that you put into place where you have um, calls that are done the day before, two days before the appointment, and being able to accommodate those that need to reschedule. And we'll discuss that and I'll give you an example a little bit more of what that process looks like. So options for data collection that you have at your disposal, commonly used methods of data collection include the following. So the review of medical record, review of medical records. So all records that detail service delivery activities can be reviewed. This includes encounters and claim data, uh, client medical records, um, facility log books, and, and other items. It is important that records be carefully designed, sufficiently detailed, and provide accurate information, um, and also have access restricted to protected confidentiality. So the use of our uh, electronic health record uh, can be facilitate can facilitate some type of medical record review. So um, we talk about focus a lot of the times. That's when you can outline a particular data set that you want to look at and focus and be able to review those medical records to get that data. Another is ex interviews with the client. Um, a client is asked through either written or in-person survey to describe what happened during their encounter or their assessment of their satisfaction within the visit. So both quantitative, which is closed-ended questions, and qualitative, which are open-ended questions, are methods that can be used. So limitations include a bias towards client reporting higher degrees of satisfaction and the provider's behavior might influence if she or he knows that the clients are being interviewed. So a lot of the times, a lot, um, many clinics do um, customer satisfaction surveys that they do at the end of the visit um, and then they're able to place them in the box. So it is done anonymously without anyone knowing that it's that particular client who is filling out that encounter. That's about how much you can get the best information um, if you're really looking at changing your processes that you can get versus um, sometimes the in-person interviews. Now, if there is an issue and you need to do, and your supervisor needs to do um, in-person interview, um, that's also a way to collect data of how practices can be enhanced. We also have direct observation. Um, if a provider's behavior is observed during an actual encounter with a client, this is direct observation. Evaluations uh, of a full range of competencies, including communication skills, can be carried out 
A main limitation is that the observer's presence might influence the provider's performance. So that's something that you need to consider if you use this option of direct observation. Lastly is interview with the healthcare provider. So providers are interviewed about how specific conditions are managed. So both use of closed and open-ended questions can be use, useful, although it is important to frame the question so that the correct answer is not suggestive. Um, a limitation for consideration with this method is that the provider tends to overreport their performance. So um, you can do a questionnaire in regards to how a provider felt that their performance had went. Um, but on the con to that, um, if they know that they're being evaluated or if it's taken into consideration, there might be some over reporting of that. Um, so. In the evaluation section um, and kind of the video that we already discussed, they spoke specifically about the PDSA cycle, and this is something that I find is very helpful, especially if you're new to quality improvement. So. Uh, so when we're talking about quality improvements being systematic and it's continuous actions that lead to be measurable, we look at the PDSA cycle. So um, the information that is gathered through the PDSA cycle is to be used to tabulate, analyze, and used to improve care that's being delivered. Um, so given the finding staff, we use a systematic approach to identify ways to improve uh, the quality of care. Um, so this systematic approach of the PDSA or the Plan Do Study Act model um, was first developed a plan for improving the quality. Then they execute the plan on a smaller scale, evaluate feedback to confirm or adjust the plan, and finally make the plan permanent if it seems to be successful. So um, examples of steps that may be taken to improve the quality of care can includes developing job aids, providing test specific training for providers, conducting more uh, patient education or strengthen relationships with the referral. So it might be access to continuing services that we might need to look at strengthening the referral process. That's just giving an example. So with the plan, you want to describe what you want to accomplish in an aim statement or a project charter or both. And we'll go a little bit more about what that looks like. You describe the current process, the issues that uh, comes with the process in the overall context. So also during the plan phase, you recruit your PDSA team members who will fully understand what you're trying to modify. So whatever the issue is or whatever the project that you're looking to um, improve, get a team together, make sure that everybody's on one accord. Um, identify the possible causes of the problem, identify possible changes or alternatives that might fix the problem or improve the process. Um, you can also, during this phase of planning, make predictions about what you think might happen with the proposed changes and why. It's good to note those. Um, plan the test of change, including a plan for what data you will collect and how you will collect it. So think about that. Um, uh, as you plan, this is a lot that goes into planning. Um, and one thing that can help with the planning phase is the implementation of SMART goals. Um, so SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. These can be used to be able to answer some of those questions that you might have as you plan um, to implement your PDSA cycle. Um, also during the plan phase, determine what resources that you think you might need. So if it's something that you're looking at a process flow, you know, one resource that you might need to look at is um, your check in, check out system or um, whether it be um, increased rates of um, testing, you know, that data that you'll need to pull from focus. So make sure that you pull those resources all together or determine what you'll need. Determine the action steps for the test along with people responsible for each step. So it might be that you have a leader who is um, tracking the PDSA cycle. You might have another team member who's pulling the data down 
um, for each month or wherever you're getting it from. Um, and you might have a team member who's analyzing that and you might have, when you come all together, somebody who's keeping that all together. So it depends on how large your team is um, and just make sure that those roles and those expectations for each one person on the team is clearly identified. So this is a collaborative effort. So determine in the plan, also determine the timeline for the PDSA cycle. So how long do you think the change will take to implement and to analyze? So this kind of gives you a time frame that also goes with your SMART goals. So when you're looking at timing, making sure it's timely um, by putting uh, um, that time frame in there. So you, this is not an endless plan or an endless test. Um, so just remember that you may need a multi-generational project planning, which refers to repeat PDSA cycles back to back as you make small modifications to each change based on the changes that resulted from each cycle. So just because you do one PDSA cycle, um, it might not fix everything. So you might have to repeat with some small changes. Um, in the video that was shown, they tried it one way in their PDSA cycle did the timing seem that it wasn't too much of a change so they tried a different approach so it's still the same qi goal they just have small pdsa tests or pdsa cycles within that one focus so on the do um, describe in writing what happened when you ran the test so collect the data that you might identify during your planning stage your team might want to find it helpful to use a check sheet flow chart. Um, there's a swim lane map or even a running chart to capture the data or the occurrences as they happen over time. So as you do it, we want to be able to make sure that we are capturing the data that we're looking for. Um, you may want to use tools like a um, um, a flow chart or anything of that nature to be able to keep that. So document your observations and any problems that you encounter or the unexpected results of your encounter. So as you're testing and you're documenting what's happening, um, it might be some things that you that happened that were unexpected that you want to make sure that you capture. So therefore, if you run this test, this PDSA cycle again, with small modifications, you can take that information into account. Uh, this study, this is really looking at comparing the data that we collected, um, um, initially collected, and looking at the, the baseline data, the data that you had for off your old process, and comparing that. So you determine if there's changes that are needed during this phase, um, resulted into the expected or unexpected outcome, decide on any lessons learned regardless how you implemented it or how you feel like you need to improve the implementation to test again. So summarize this in writing, what you learned, including unexpected results, successes, and failures. So therefore you have notation of that. And then act as last. So based on what you've learned from the test, the PDSA cycles that you placed in there, whether it be the one or the two or the, five, the fifth one, um, you should be able to, uh, on the final one, after all those notes and implementations, you should be able to act by adapting. So adapting, modifying the changes and repeat the PDSA cycle, including preparing a plan for the next test. If the first cycle didn't work, um, you're either going to adopt. This is implement the changes in the small scale area where you first test it and then consider expanding to other departments. So it might be something that worked very, very well for one health department in your region or within your current health department that you might want to um, get that up and streamline first and then do PDSA cycle again with another health department within your region to see if those changes work. Or lastly, um, you can act to abandon it. So changes um, that you uh, tested and thought would work, you can change your approach entirely and then repeat the PDSA cycle with something else brand new. So um, we wanna make sure that as you develop these, that you take um, really good notes on what works and what doesn't work as far as your quality improvement efforts. And something that's helpful for you all to do, I mean, I create changed the graphic from what it was last year um, when we're looking at the PDSA cycle. Um, 
to really looking at the the steps. And so if you want access to this worksheet, um, there is a link, direct link to a PDSA cycle worksheet where you can write down um, your thoughts and as you all plan and start having conversations of what you're wanting to look at for the 2023 year and improving um, within your regions and within your health departments. Um, there are some things that kind of help you start those conversations. All right, so when we're talking again more specifically, um, family planning, quality improvement, um, I mentioned that your steps. So step one is looking at um, the performance measures. We talked about as far as the performance measures that you have as an option to be able to get data from um, are your health outcomes and then your structure measures. So after you look at which focus that you want to focus on, um, then you move to step two. Step two is um, data collection. So this is the do part of the PDSA. So you review. Um, medical records, review, exit interview of the client, direct observation, interview with the healthcare provider, whatever that you chose to do as far as your data collection. And then the last is the evaluation. So this is the most one of the most important sections too as well. This is a part of the study in the ACT and the PDSA model. So this information is to be uh, captured as far as tabulated, analyzed, and used to improve care. So this is where you look and see, did our uh, PDS cycle was successful? Did it meet the goals or the aim statement that we had for our region or our health department? And then making sure we have all those news to implement the change. Um, so this talks about a little bit more about quality improvement. So um, this information gives a little bit more focus on what the expectation is um, of all of our Title X clinics. So each regional director's area must identify one, one quality improvement measure um, for their counties within that administrative region. So remember I said just one. If you wanna do more than one, you can, but for as Title X um, required reporting and what we're doing um, with uh, the resources that's been provided to us, Grant reporting, we only have to report one, but we can report as many as we can for each region, but we're reporting on and a minimum of one for each region. Um, we also must um, document the progress to accomplishing um, that QI measure, and so this must be reported. So um, as I stated before, we report to our grantor that these are the quality improvement measures that we're looking to include, improve access to family planning or improve family planning services that we're delivering in our areas. Um, so it's great to have a measure, but if we don't have reporting that goes with that showing our progress, or maybe it's not progress, or maybe we have barriers to meet that's, um, that's causing us not to meet our goals, what those are. So um, that must be reported for on the uh, regional FPQI reporting form. So we'd like to have a baseline um, if you're selecting um, a measure, having that baseline of current year, where it's at, um, and then reporting on it mid year, how your progression is coming, and then of course the end of the year reporting. So um, we as MCH, provide you with the LARC and no show quarterly, uh, the no show rates quarterly. So we now have um, um, a full team of our EPIs that's able to assist us in this regard. So if there's any additional reports that are placed in focus that you want more information on, just let me know and I can make sure that we can get those pulled. Um, so let's look at examples. So I um, pulled something um, more specific to 2022, just so you can get an idea of what you need to be looking for. So you go back as you develop your FPQI measure, you look at what you're selecting, whether it be no-show rates, whether it be screenings, whether it be um, um, access to care, whether it be whatever it is, just review the baseline data for 2022. So we need the baseline data. Um, you need the baseline data so you know where you're starting from and where you're trying to get to. So determine the focus for the next year, 
after you review your data and you pick that out, develop a goal for the, that healthcare department or that region. Um, so an example is family planning, patient accessing services. So that's a goal. Our goal is looking at access and services. You build a QI measure, which is smart. Um, uh, decrease the no-show rate of scheduled appointments by 5% over the next year. So again, this gives specific the no-show rate measurable. We want to decrease by 5%. Um, it, um, and we have it timely as well. So it's relevant and it's timely. So over the next year, so we know that we're going to capture the information over the next 12 months. From there, then you develop your aim statement. This helps you keep you focused. So the aim statement is a little bit more detailed. So the region will decrease the overall number of no-show family planning visits by 5% from its baseline, because we got the baseline data 2022 of 30 during 2022 to 28 in 2023. So that is a 5% difference, right? So we know who's going to be doing it. We know our overall goal is to decrease the no-show rate because we are trying to increase access to family planning services. We know how much we want to decrease it by, and we have that information as far as our baseline of where, we, where we're starting from and where we're trying to go that keeps us on target. This is the FPQI form, um, ex what it looks like in the RCPP um, document that um, is completed in its entirety. So there's other four areas where you're looking at um, community engagement, education, promotion. There is even one for uh, infant mortality. But the last Title 10 required, which is mandatory, um, which is part five, is your family planning quality improvement measure. So what I did, I gave you an example of the example previous, of what we talked about increasing family planning visits within the region. That's our goal, right? Our QI measure of how we're going to do that is decrease the number of no-show visits by 5% during 2023. Um, so that's our QI measure. That's where we know where we need to go. But if you see at the end of that, I put the baseline that's there so we can stay on target. Um, it's on our plan and it's going to be on our um, FQ, FPQI report. So on our plan, if we just look at the plan, we can see the baseline is 30 in 2022 and we're trying to get to 28 in 2023. That's the 5%. So one activity that we're going to do, you can have one, you can have two, you can have three, it doesn't matter. Um, we need at least one, at least one goal, one activity. Um, you see in there that I put the activity was provide reminder calls to schedule patients two days before the scheduled appointment. So that's an activity that we're going to do and that's what we're going to implement um, across the region. So if I have six county health departments in my region, Six county health departments are going to implement this. They're going to call, have reminded calls. So who's going to do that? Well, I have the receptions and nursing. It might look different from your area of who does that. But the expectation is that the receptionist or even the nursing department takes that list. Um, 48 hour list that they have, that they're pulling their patients down and to call or remind them of their appointments. Um, that's going to be the activity. The hope is that. Well, through that, we can reduce the no-show rate, right? So I'm going to go to the next page. So this is on the plan. When we go to our reporting form, um, you can see the information that's still there. So we have counties that's covered by the APRN services. We have strawberry, orange, apples, kiwi, and watermelon, and peach counties. Um, Jane Smith is regional director. Um, our DNM is John Doe. The information's at the top. So again, our goal is to increase family planning visits. We want to be able to increase access. So our QI measure is to decrease the number of no-show rates by 5% during 2023, because that's what we said we wanted to do. And then our aim statement, we talked about this a few slides over, but this keeps us focused. Counties were to decrease the no-show rate of, no, of scheduled visits by 5% from 30 in 2022 to 28 in 2023. Again, um, this just keeps us on target and intentional. So if you see is the county level data, the first report, 
that you send in, which is your baseline report, it would have all of the information that's at the top that's outlined here. And then it would have your counties here with the baseline data. That's the first report. The mid year report, um, which takes data from January the 1st through June 30th, um, and that report is due by July 31st, that's your mid year report. So from strawberry, orange, apple, kiwi, watermelon, and peach county, I have all of them listed here. I have their baselines, and then I'm getting numbers of where we were as far as the no show rate, and I'm plugging them in here. Right. So um, then I submit the report for the deadline, just so we can keep ourselves accountable of being if we're on target or if we're off target, but then also too, this provides us an MCH to be able to see how you all are measuring and if we need to support or if there's any additional questions that you might have. Um, because again, as you carry this out, you're changing your PDSA cycle, right? So we implement what our aim statement is going to be, but we also have a PDSA cycle of what we're planning on doing to, to change that. So, um, and then the last report, um, which is taking everything, the year-end report, um, that's due January 31st of the, of 2024. Um, because it's going to take you about a month to get all your data together and everything else up for the holidays. So you, this is a report that's continuing. So then you provide us with the final numbers for all those uh, counties that's being covered. And then you'll finish this piece out. So what actions did you take to meet the measure? So we did the reminder calls two days before the appointment. That might have been the first intervention, uh, but you might have something else that you want to add. We tried that, but then we did. And you can add what else you did here. Um, factors that contribute to success. Uh, so you are able to receptionist call the schedule, uh, call scheduled patients two days before an appointment, and they reschedule them as um, if they needed it, they couldn't attend. So that decreased your no show rate. That that helps do the calls. You'll put that in this factors contributing to its success. Um, if you have barriers that impend its success. So one barrier that I can see in this scenario would be the incorrect phone numbers or the numbers are disconnected on the patient record. So the last time they were in the clinic or when they call and set up the appointment, they gave you one number. Um, and then now when you call to remind two days before that number, they lost their minutes on their phone or they didn't purchase anymore. So there's no way to get a hold of them. Those are outliers that you can't control. So any barriers that um, permitted you to be successful, you'll add there. The form is very easy as such as if you click on SharePoint, it takes you directly to where you upload this form. So there's no need to print it off. You just save it, click SharePoint, and then use it as an attachment. Uh, if you by chance misplaced this form or can't find it, we and MCH keep a copy of it. So you can just easily MC, uh, email MCH training and we'll be able to give you um, the copy of the form so you can update. This is also here a link to the form of SharePoint. So we're heading to one of the last topics of the client satisfaction survey. So um, if you remember me talking about this is one method to collect um, data as far as the quality improvement. So client satisfaction surveys um, is to assure that clients are receiving high quality services. And this is also used to identify any gaps that might be in the system. So um, it's important to know uh, what's going on within your clinics. So when we're talking about um, what's expected, all family clinic service sites and contract agencies must assess client satisfaction with services at a minimum of once a year. So um, sometime in between, you know, uh, through the fiscal year or the calendar year, July 1, fiscal year through July 1 through June 30th, or the calendar year of January 1st to December 31st, um, you're to implement some, some sort of client satisfaction. 
satisfaction survey. Um, so 10% of clients with a maximum 50 surveys um, administered or a minimum of 10 surveys administered for smaller counties. So if you're in a large county, we're looking at um, at least 50 surveys that's been distributed and collected. Um, same thing for a smaller county health department, we're looking at at least 10. So with these, the clinical manager staff are to review the client evaluations and identify specific actions to improve for services. Um, so at a minimum, documentation must include how the top findings is addressed. So documentation of completed evaluations and actions taken must be kept on file for at least one year. So when we come into the site visits, we need to at least see that you've collected at a minimum, if you're a small county health department 10, that satisfaction surveys within a year um, and any action that was taken um, through those if there were issues um, and for larger county health departments a minimum of 50. Um, so when we do come we can say we're still not only are we working on quality improvement but this is also we're taking feedback from the community and the clients that we're serving about how our services are and how what we can do to improve those. So um, all county health department sites that are providing family planning services must do this. So um, a county health department or region can create their own, but we do have one standardized and we updated it um, that you see here um, of a client satisfaction survey. So this is a standard. You don't have to use it. You can develop your own, but we have to have some form to show that you're collecting the community or the client feedback. Um, to access those, there's just an English version here and the Spanish version here. They're also on the Family Planning Clinical Hub underneath the clinical forms. So if you just want to pull that down and be able to uh, print those off and use that, you can. And then here I have some additional resources. Um, as you look at developing your quality improvement measure for your um, county health departments of your region, um, you can look and see in regards to some other areas that's more specific for family planning um, that you can focus on. So there's a link about um, patient experience and improvement, you know, improvement. Uh, toolkit. We have the person centered contraception counseling, how to do that better if you are still struggling with that, or um, how do we use data to increase the clinical efficiency? So how do we use the data that we are receiving to be able to implement quality improvement outcomes? So these are really good guides that are for you. All right, so I have this up here. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or any of the thing when we're talking about quality improvement or family planning quality, improvement, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, this is my contact information. Um, as stated before, um, we have allocated time in between now and um, the Christmas holiday season um, to be able to assist the regions with developing their um, community participation plans, regional community participation plans, um, which the quality improvement piece is a part of that. So as we set up time to discuss those with you or, or the list that was put out, the sign up sheet that was put out there with Ira, um, if you get to that point where you need some help with that, um, we have those designated times, or if those times do not work, please do not hesitate to send me an email because um, my job is here to make sure that you are successful and the services that you're delivering in, in the health department. So I'm here, here to, to be of support and be of help as much as I can. Um, and I'm welcome and open for you all to use me in that regard. All right, so at this time, this is the end of the training. Again, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Thank you for your time.